Hello, everyone. I'm Chris Gordon, Director of New Accounts, and I'll be moderating our webinar today. Well, spring is really here, and we're all very excited by that. I'm so happy to have you join us for Pop-Up or Perish. We've got some radical things to say about the current state of retail pop-up, and the word perish might be a tip-off. We also have some practical, tactical advice on how to make your retail pop-up really pop. With that, let me jump right in and introduce the team who will be speaking with you today. They're both innovators and influencers in experiential marketing and pop-up. First, we have Bradley Daves. He's been creative director at several top New York agencies where he helped redefine the concept of interactive marketing. Bradley was creating pop-up experiences before we even thought to call it pop-up and has crafted inventive and thought-provoking brand campaigns for more than 85 Fortune 500 companies and retailers. Next, meet Michael Decker. With over 20 years in the business, Michael knows how to create memorable brand moments. He has led award-winning marketing and communications efforts for international retail, health, CPG, beauty, and hospitality brands. You've probably seen some of his work for Metafast Weight Loss, Sweet and Low, Matrix Biolage Hair Care, Barnes & Noble, The Waldorf Astoria, and Foot Locker. I know you guys have some provocative things to share, so let's get started. All right, thanks, Chris. Uh, hi, everybody, welcome. Thanks for being here. Um, we're gonna do our best to make our time together worth your while. Uh, as Chris said, Michael and I have had an insider's view of this pop-up thing for a while, and what you hear from us will be the unvarnished truth, which is why I feel obligated to start things off with the public service announcement. Physical retail is not dead. I repeat, in-store shopping is not dead. Okay, granted it may not be as healthy as it was 20 years ago, but who is? Physical retail has taken a beating over the last several years, pummeled by web rooming, cowered by e-commerce, distracted by delivery challenges. I won't lie, it's been rough. Yet physical retail perseveres. Sure, many brick and mortar retailers with large footprints are finding themselves challenged by the short-term pressures of sales growth and the long-term positioning of their businesses. But there is light at the end of the tunnel. Physical retail incumbents have one surprising advantage over their online competitors, physical stores. Now, there's no doubt that online shopping is a way of the future, but it's not the only way. The Census Bureau reported that U.S. e-commerce retail sales in the first quarter of 2016 accounted for only 7.8% of total retail sales. Now, why isn't that number higher? because shoppers have realized that they love physical stores. They seek tactile, emotional relationships with the brands they love. Shoppers might conduct research online, but they need to see and touch and connect with an item before purchasing it. This is an enduring and really powerful need, one so strong that I believe it brought physical retail back from the brink. And when the shopper realized that she could have both the convenience of digital access and the soul feeding satisfaction of physical retail, she jumped on it. A study by MasterCard found that eight out of 10 consumers now use a smartphone or tablet while shopping in store. And Forrester predicts that cross-channel retail sales will reach 1.8 trillion in the US by the end of the year. So the physical retail shop is not dead. But the terrestrial store that does not forge and nurture an all-encompassing, meaningful relationship with the shopper will be. The shopper now seeks, well, she demands actually, a brand experience that is satisfying and friction-free. Call it omni-channel, call it holistic, call it 360-degree marketing, they're all basically the same thing a seamless, personalized, and comparable brand experience regardless of platform or channel. 
Robin Lewis, the CEO of the Robin Report and a former executive at VF Corporation and Women's Wear Daily, said it best. We are right now in the middle of the biggest, most profound transformation in the history of retail. The online players get it and they are jumping on board by, by jumping offline. The shopper connecting power of 360 degree marketing has not been lost on digital retailers who are now actively seeking innovative ways to converge channels. They realize that connecting online with in-world is critical to creating satisfying relationship building personalized shopping experiences. Online sales organizations like Warby Parker, uh, Bonobos, M. Jemmy and Frank and Oak have all created physical spaces to enhance and extend their online presence. Even digital giant Amazon has gotten physical. The company added 30 terrestrial locations last year and is looking to expand that number to 100 over the next coming months. So clearly, both digital and physical retailers must put serious thought into redefining and re-energizing the shopping experience. To succeed, these companies must become agile enough so that they can continue to reinvent themselves over and over and over again, reaching and pivoting based on what's happening in the market and in the heart of the shopper. Now, I may shock you with this, but retail organizations are not always the best pivoters. When I say big box store, I am pretty sure your immediate response isn't super nimble. The current need for retailers to shift and adapt in real time is in large part why the use of pop-up is surging. Retail pop-up is all about agility and pivoting and nimblosity, which I'm pretty sure is a word. That's why it is now the most vital tool in the retail marketing mix. But, you know, it wasn't always this way, Bradley. Back in the day, a pop-up was simply a flash sale, a quick way to move some merchandise. San Francisco merchant Joseph Marver upped the ante in the 1980s when he turned his dress shop into a more lucrative costume center during the month of October. By the way, Marver later sold this business to Spencer Gifts, and they grew it exponentially. Those are the spirit Halloween stores we see all over the place now. At about the same time on the East Coast, Party City also realized that Halloween was a huge draw for customers. Since then, the company has programmed its entire retail cycle around Halloween, not Christmas. Pop-up retail was a smart option, but it was just that, an option. That's not the case anymore. Retail brands must pop up or they'll perish. I know, very dramatic, but you know what? It's also very true. The 80s were a long, long time ago. Heck, the 2000s were a long time ago. I don't have to tell you guys this, it's a whole new game. The rules have changed and it is the shopper who's making these new rules. So how did she get to be the boss of us? The new empowered shopper is the result of a perfect storm of accessible digital technology, narcissism, social media, mobile proliferation, endless information, selfies, millennials, of course, citizen journalism, and a wildly expanded worldview. And at this very moment, this enlightened shopper is browsing in your store and on your website, she is judging you and actively influencing your future brand equity. So who is she? As a person, I mean. Medallion Retail did some research exploring buyer personas. We talked to thousands of shoppers and discovered that each primarily falls into one of eight customer types. First up, I want to introduce you to the advocate, representing 8% of the shopper population. She is your branded enthusiast, an early adopter, a true believer. She's an influencer. She loves to make discoveries and then share them with everyone she knows. For her, being first is mandatory. Next, we have the caretaker. 
comprising 18% of the shopper population, the caretaker has to justify her purchases, spending as little time and as little money as possible. They are minimalists. For them, good enough is, well, good enough. Thirdly, I want you to meet the indulgent. If she wants it, she will buy it. She is an impulse shopper who buys with her heart. If it's a must have, she will have and will worry about how to pay for it later. These retail thrill seekers make up 18% of all shoppers. Here we have the student. She wants to think about a purchase and read about it and study it and talk to a few friends and then think about it some more. Documentation and details drive this slow to buy 10% of the shopper population. Here's the conventional, or 9%. She is a consumer who plays by the rules, traditional and thoughtful. She follows the path that a brand sets for her. Next, we have the mechanist. She is our sixth shopper, and she comprises 17% of the shopping population. She loves to work the system, to find the deals and work the angles. She likes a challenge, and her passion is to manipulate a situation to her best advantage. 10% of shoppers are what we call gradualists, the customer who buys on her own terms, and only when she feels a real need. She will not be rushed. She takes things one step at a time, and she doesn't like to be pursued. Then we have the final 10% of shoppers, what we call the sophisticate. She operates from a position of rationalized indulgence, self-focused and discerning. The sophisticate is allergic to the word cheap. She believes you get what you pay for. She demands quality and is happy to pay the price. She also wants your undying devotion in return. So the sophisticates and uh, all of the shoppers desire something else as well, meaningful brand interaction. Now, price alone is no longer enough. Service is no longer enough. Neither is quality nor convenience. Meaningful retail engagement is all of these things and more in whatever combination the shopper demands at any given time. That's all. And at one point, the retail experience was the answer, but consider that now, the experience in this era of the demanding shopper. From the perspective of someone who desires a relationship, to them an experience starts to seem vague, clinical, almost cookie cutter. Even the word experience can feel sterile and disconnected. It holds no emotional weight and seems to completely ignore the concept of personalization. Not like a shopper moment. We devise the concept of the shopper moment as the logical evolution of the retail experience. The shopper moment isn't about size, it's about the size of its impact. And there are no clocks ticking during a shopper moment. What matters is the weight of the memory it creates. A shopper moment is emotional, it's a conversation, it's relevant. And we chose the word moment deliberately with very specific intent. A moment transcends time, it speaks to an interaction that is satisfying and poetic, soulful, maybe even a little romantic. I mean, suffice to say that a shopper moment is way better and way more effective than a retail, uh, basic retail experience. And clearly, we're passionate about this and could go on and on, but uh, we're here for pop-up. So if the shopper moment intrigues you, uh, we are presenting uh, another uh, webinar that will break that all down. And if that sounds like something you might be interested in, uh, let us know and uh, we'll put some things together. So to quickly recap, in stores not dead, shoppers like physical stores, Shoppers became empowered and more demanding. A retail experience used to be the answer, but that's no longer enough. So now it's all about the shopper moment. And the ultimate shopper moment, it's the pop-up. See how we brought that all back around? 
Good show, Bradley. Think of the pop-up retail, um, think of retail pop-up as the material manifestation of the shopper moment, which we trademark, by the way. It is a physical setting, but it's also a mindset. The pop-up is the place where a brand's digital and in-world personas meld, creating a whole that is greater than the sum of its parts. Retail pop-up is attitude amplified. A moment-centric pop-up is must do at least six things. Here are the rules. Number one, it has to evoke emotion. The pop-up should serve as a connection, an invitation, a provocation, a promise. Think heartfelt and memory tapping. So I wanted to share with you a shot of the uh, Indie Wed pop-up bridal shop. I will tell you uh, from even recent experience, like two weeks ago, life does not get any more emotional than at weddings and Indie Wed did a phenomenal job in bringing, in bringing us there. Um, their unique business model was brought to life in the physical world. Secondly, retail pop-up must reflect meticulous planning. It is a major undertaking where details matter enormously. And the big idea is to seem intimate. Definitely do worry about the small stuff. So here we have uh, Tiffany. Uh, they built this um, this pop-up in London and, and clearly spared no expense, covering the big things like their iconic blue box, but they also covered the little things like custom the custom gilt railings that you can see at the entry. And, and generally speaking, um, beautiful, thoughtful detail is such an inherent part of the Tiffany brand that more than many, many other brands, it makes sense that they really drill down and get all of those details right. Yeah, and they and they definitely did a phenomenal job here. Mm -hmm. All right. Every pop-up must be driven by a single measurable objective. You're going to hear a lot more about that in a few minutes, but let's get to the next rule. Great pop-up will surprise and delight. The goal is to astonish the shopper, disrupt her routine, and actually astound her. Give her a real moment, make her smile or laugh or just wonder, and give her something to talk about, and tweet, and pin, and share, and like, and snap, and whatever's next in the world of social media. A um, couple of examples I want to share here. Um, Zagat's Tiny Cafe provides microscopic versions of New York's best rated, most Instagrammed meals. Very surprising and also very shareable. Uh, it really links online and uh, in world in a really unexpected idea. And I, I think this is a literal example of the fact that uh, a big idea can be um, tiny plates of food that uh, it, it doesn't have to take up a lot of physical space to make a really big impact on a shopper. Yeah, this one is so great. A, a, yeah. a literal example of less is more, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, this next image is um, a pop-up globe theater that was built in New Zealand and was designed to the exact Shakespearean proportions, much to the delight of its classical theater patrons. And speaking of tweeting and snapping, rule number five says that the perfect shop pop-up will feature a robust social media component. Give the shopper authentic reasons to care, but also to share. Empower her to get the word out. Build in physical opportunities for selfies and real-time reporting. Strategic social media components will expand the impact of your pop-up exponentially. That's why more than 90% of brands use more than two social media networks. All right, um, this one uh, is, this example is the uh, Gatorade Fuel Lab, uh, which was present at uh, South by Southwest and allowed its visitors the opportunity to sign in, interact and share their experience via touch screens positioned throughout the exhibits. Uh, another gem. Uh, in the social media uh, universe is Kylie Jenner's much anticipated pop-in in LA and New York. It was a vlogger's paradise 
with special invitations to very well-known vloggers that generated lines around the block and back. And it, it, it was perfectly positioned to reach out to those, uh, to those who are her, uh, her biggest uh, fans. And um, all of the attention um, and the attendance and the buzz around it was driven by social media. It was hugely popular. And you say, uh, you mentioned uh, Michael, fans uh, stood in line waiting to get in. Kylie, for whatever reason, has a strict line policy, and part of that is once you're in the line, you cannot leave even to go to the bathroom. So some of those people waited 14 hours uh, to yeah. get in. Yeah, and, and then the, and then the funnier thing is the line became a story on social exactly. media. Exactly, so it, it just it just feeds on itself exponentially. Yeah. yeah, and whether on purpose or or just uh, things being fortuitous, uh, that manipulation of social media and uh, the creation of your customers acting as your promoters, uh, it's done brilliantly here. Yeah, yeah, they are the masters of that as well. Yeah. Um, all right, so uh, finally, um, great retail pop-up must be temporary. How can they miss you if you never leave? So just make sure that you leave them wanting more. Harness FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. It is a very strong factor. Limiting Limited time only is a powerful phrase that can get your shoppers to buy. Um, good example here uh, is Converse. Uh, they created this temporary mobile pop-up made from a uh, 1950s era house trailer uh, to reinforce the incredible heritage of that brand. So great tie-in um, and the fact that it's mobile makes it uh, very temporary. Um, another one uh, is Puma. Um, they, they stylized a temporary pop-up um, in partnership with Ferrari, which is an interesting duo, um, from a shipping crate to showcase its fast cutting edge style. So here today and gone tomorrow in a flash. Yeah, I know you, you literally cannot get any more symbolic of temporary than with a mobile home and a shipping crate. So, right. you know, they, they took it literally and then kind of elevated it way beyond what anybody could imagine. All right, though, these are great, uh, some great retailer examples, but uh, some pop-ups aren't looking to make a sale. In fact, many of them are not even hosted by retailers. A pop-up event is theater. It's entertainment. Pop-up is a show staged right out there in the middle of life. And it's, and it's not just for stores anymore. Your competition is no longer solely from the retail sector. Tech companies are opening up temporary spaces to demo and promote their products like eBay and Snapchat. Wellness organizations like the Heart and Lung Association are using pop-ups for screenings and to generate awareness. The Colorectal Cancer Association invited folks to walk through an anatomically correct colon. Now that's a memorable learning experience. <laughs> homeless, active, homeless activist group, The Street Store, transformed alleys and side streets into hangouts and distributed free clothing. Hip new restaurants, luxury spas, and artisanal bars are popping up in all the most unexpected places. And so are celebrities. Last year, Kanye West, Justin Bieber, Frank Ocean, Drake, and the aforementioned Kylie Jenner hosted limited time only shops and events. Take that as inspiration. It's important to expand your view of who and what your competition is and to understand the larger context in which you are creating events. You wanna bring your A game because you know Kanye will. The man is awesome at pop-up, partially because his confidence and audacity levels are, are off the charts. As we now have seen, he starts to kind of reemerge a bit in the news lately. But uh, it's also due to the fact that he knows exactly what he wants before he begins. And you need to as well. Okay, Bradley, so, so far we have talked about why you should do a pop-up. Now we come to a bigger question. Why would you do a pop-up? This isn't about semantics, it's about objectives, which I mentioned earlier. 
the biggest mistake that brands make when creating a pop-up is not having a clear singular reason for doing it. There are all sorts of bad reasons to do pop-up, like the other guys are doing it, or it looks like loads of fun, or there are a couple of bucks left in the budget that have to be used before the end of the fiscal, or I know a guy who uh, has this space. <laughs> I love or, my cousin Vinny. <laughs> like, uh, you like my cousin Vinny uh, in the uh, yeah. kitchen. <laughs> or, or even the CMO has decided that pop-ups are in this year. I will tell you folks, there's only one real reason to stage a pop-up. It's to create a shopper moment and to make that moment resonate and to see some good ROI you must have a clear, measurable objective. Consider any one of these six. Build the brand. With a pop-up, you create an opportunity to redefine your narrative and fine tune your brand story. You can experiment with tone and positioning and monitor responses to shifts in brand presentation. Good example of that is um, the Heineken Lounge, which was also at uh, South by Southwest. That was two years ago. Um, it was um, it was 360 degree theater, a way for Heineken to showcase the brand with video plus product samples to raise perceptions with the movers and shakers and influencers that attend South by Southwest. And and you know, even again the details. Uh, down to the iconic green that is uh, represents uh, Heineken without having to actually say a word makes that you know you could see here how large an impact it has and and how it really helps to create the vibe of the space. Yeah, I, I love brands that have um, found a way to own a color, and Heineken is, is yeah. one of those few. Yes, right. it's the other, but but uh, I, I just love I love what they did. Yeah. All right, another one um, is um, Target's ho Holiday Wonderland, which uh, lifted the curtain on holiday plans um, in October of that year without one complaint. And another is, uh, is Pantone and Sephora. Um, they put together this joint promotion called All About Color, each simultaneously boosting the other's brand presence in this highly unlikely pairing of a B2B brand and a consumer business brand. Um, I think this I think this is so smart. Yeah. It's it, an amazing it, it, unlikely. Right. Yeah. And it's it's surprising for a whole bunch of reasons. And it's I think it's beautifully executed. Yeah, I would agree. Okay. A second potential objective. Introduce a product. What better way to showcase a new offering and educate the shopper about its value than to build a pop-up event around it? Um, this, uh, this his, what I think is, is, I think what we both agree is an hysterical um, execution is, is the, uh, the Coke mini launch and a sampling pop-up event proves that the stopping power um, of a great sense of humor. It's, elegantly simple and uh it's funny and it's surprising and the joke is uh immediate and it's involving and engaging to passers-by uh you know just from the idea of taking you know words coke mini uh literally you know i think it's it's really great and i i really like the teeny trash can next to it <laughs> Me too. It's my favorite. Well, I just think it's great. And, you know, it's just that's the that's what makes it memorable. Yeah, yeah. Again, we talk. We 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 often talk about the fact that it doesn't it doesn't cost a lot to come up with a big idea, and this is one of those big ideas. Agree. All right. All right. Um, let's move on to um, uh, Snapple. Um, it's Im impossible to ignore Snapple's white tea introduction. Uh, which was done via high-flying balloons in New York City's Bryant Park to quote-unquote elevate perceptions at high tea. I know for fact that this is one of Bradley's very favorites. It is um, because that's me right there and this balloon in the middle getting my turn finally to uh, to take a flight over Bryant Park and uh, I mean it, it, it was a great event and uh, the company came and asked us for a sampling event, and our counsel was, 
you need to do more than just pass pass out you know tastes of your newest uh, product. Uh, you have to create some kind of buzz and and physical experience around it. So, sort of like the Coke Mini, we took the idea of high tea literally. And at the end of the day, this is what it uh, this is what it looked like. And uh, it was it was a big success. Uh, Snapple still considers it uh, among its best product launches. Yeah, for sure. I could see why. Yeah. And you overcame your fear of heights. All in one day. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right. Um, let's look at the uh, the next generation of uh, Hello Kitty, Pokemon, and other similar brands. This one. Uh, was launched as Line Friends, uh, still very popular, it was launched in the US with this um, incredibly beautiful pop-up store. All right, uh, moving on um, to the next objective, and that is um, maybe you just want to test something. The pop-up is fertile ground for information gathering. You can use it to explore new geographies, you can test new concepts, discover new audiences, experiment with new formats, or investigate potential partnerships or sponsorships. Think of the pop-up as a lab to gather qualitative and quantitative intel. So um, uh, celebrity chef David Chang went great credibility to um, a, uh, a private label brand, brand, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, called President's Choice, in testing at their uh, PC Insiders collection. So again, this was just, uh, this was just uh, meant to, uh, to test the brand um, and to just test the products. Um, I also have um, uh, Hulu, um, who effectively tested its newly proposed line lineup by letting its visitors watch what they like, uh, which became a win-win for brand building and for their research department. And I, th I think this is uh, another example of making something tangible out of what is usually a, a digital interaction in a set up like this, Hulu can gather all sorts of data, uh, demographic, psychographic, and, and anecdotal on programming and the brand experience itself. Uh, I think this is a really smart way to use pop-up, and I, I, I love what they've done here. Yeah, and it was it was completely um, uh, collectible data, and it was also co completely observable data. Sometimes um, research, you, you, you don't really know the environment that the the testing is occurring in. This was all uh, up front and center and uh, and in real time. So it was a, a great idea. Yeah, particularly true in a lot of the uh, uh, tech and digital uh, yeah. companies doing pop up. Yep. Okay. Um, a fourth possible objective is. Um, Quite simply, sell something. It is completely valid for a retailer to want to stage a pop-up in order to move some merchandise. That's ultimately why we're all here. So um, UGG, uh, the brand UGG, uh, which is a, a Decker's brand, I think, um, did it by popping up in malls where they had no permanent presence, but wanted to. So why not, we can't get in the mall, why not, why not test the space? And that's what UGG did. Um, another good one is um, the bobble bar, um, which pushed its um, the uh, the must list of merchandise in a pop-up store that was hard to differentiate from its permanent store neighbors. Again, same thing. They did such a good job with this pop-up, you couldn't even tell that it wasn't a permanent a permanent store. Yeah. All right. So another objective uh, could be to create major buzz. There's nothing wrong with attention. Just make sure to clarify and control the message. Then throw open the doors to traditional and, of course, social media. Um, RuPaul is an example here. Um, her, uh, her second comeback coincided with her season premiere of Drag Race. The show lifted the pop-up, and the pop-up lifted the show. I could do a pop-up that works thing here, but it doesn't really make any sense if you all don't know that I'm spelling it with an E, which I am. So just imagine that. <laughs> Excellent, Bradley. Excellent. There you go. <laughs> okay. Um, David Lloyd Fitness Clubs in London ran a, um, a quote-unquote run for your bun uh, promotion by serving healthy lunches that you could only pay for 
with exercise. It created a media sensation and was the talk of the town. It's um, such a clever idea. It's like singing for your supper, just a little bit sweatier. Um, it's a brilliant buzz building idea. You can, you know, you can imagine all the TV guys and vloggers reporting from their from their bikes or being challenged by their cohorts back at the station. I I really think this is a a, a brilliant idea on all different kinds of levels. Yeah, for sure. All right, so I think this is the, the last example, um, some cementing shopper relationships. If that is your objective, remember the power of exclusivity. Create an invitation-only event and watch the brand love grow. Um, we, see, we see some of this going on with um, Adidas, uh, who created this VIP theater um, only for its most devoted fans with Adidas-inspired music and Adidas-inspired videos. Um, so you had to be a, a, an A number one fan to get in, and uh, and then you were you were just immersed in the world of Adidas. Um, another example, uh, and once again, Target. Uh, this time with a, a look at the interior, um, they gave its mom shoppers a safe and memorable moment for their kids at its Wonderland pop up. And it's it you, as you can see it's beautifully executed. I mean, that's that's something that Target, you know, cannot can always churn out. And uh, the activities are integrated into the display itself. And I, I my eyes just keep going to the uh, the ball pits and how insanely clean they all look, which is, you know, actually hugely important when you want mom. Mom appreciates a not disgusting ball pit. So yes. Target seems to know that really well. I think it's, you know, I'd throw my kid in there. I'd have no qualms about it. <laughs> I, would throw, I would throw yeah. all my kids in that ball God, yeah. It'd be fun. A, a, a <laughs> all right. So that's it, guys. Uh, these are the only objectives the retail marketer should consider when contemplating a pop-up. And you need to choose only one. Well, maybe you could choose two if you stage things just just right. Think about it. In marketing, like in life, when you try to do too many things at the same time, it can become chaos. Nothing really gets done. It is critical to focus on the why of your pop-up. Make the objective clear and measurable. Get input and polish it up. Articulate it clearly and get it accepted across the organization. Only then should you start planning your best pop-up ever. Landing on the right objective can be very tough. It takes concerted effort, and it begins with asking all the right questions. An outside partner with unique perspective can sometimes help here. Let's look at some of the questions we ask our clients at this stage in the process. Firstly, here we go. What is your marketing objective? Remember, the marketing objective is different from the pop-up objective, and both are different from the business objective. Know them all and understand how they interrelate. Second, who is your target shopper? Why? Who else would you like to reach? Third, what is the critical message you want delivered to shoppers? What do you want them to remember, appreciate? and tell their friends. Fourth, what tone and voice does your brand want to or need to speak in? What is your perceived personality? Is that the one that you still want? Fifth, what's your budget? You have to face the dollar question eventually, and it's best to do it early on. And sixth, how will you measure success? What will success look like? What will change as a result of this pop-up? These are the most important questions that drive our conversations with our clients. There are a few more, and if you'd like to have the entire list, let us know, and we'll get that out to you. Absolutely. All right, so where are we now? Pop-up is great. The competition is crazy. Kanye can do anything. A clear objective for the pop-up is mandatory. Because that objective is really our starting point. 
now that we know what we have to make happen, we can throw open the doors to themes and formats and concepts. This is the fun part. This is also the part that trips up a certain kind of pop-up maker, and I'll just come out and say it. The Frady Cat, not standard marketing terminology, but uh, I think it's an apt description. Pop-up is not a game for the faint of creative heart. Sharper expectations are high and only gain altitude as time goes on. You've seen what brands are doing out there. Much of it is truly amazing because it challenges the status quo. This is the time to find your inner risk taker, your inner Kanye, and set him free. Be bold, be thrilling, be a little scary. At this stage, there's no reason not to. I'm going to share with you a few tactics you can use to uh, uncover those uh, big ideas. The first is uh, change the game. Mix up the rules, make up your own, and then go ahead and break them. Uh, nice example of some thinking uh, that went into this uh, um, execution by Nike uh, in Spain. Kids were missing out on the tradition of playing football in the street because of the expansion of urban sports facilities. So uh, the brand created uh, laser projected pop-up soccer fields for the kids and it, it brought to life their anytime, anywhere campaign and spoke to individual communities. And it's, you know, it's, an, it's a good example of um, deciding what can and can be done in the old rule book and then kind of breaking that and finding a new way to make something happen. And I, I love how you just correctly referred to soccer as football in Spain. Bradley, that was terrific. Thank um, you. Also, <laughs> I, I will say that that this literally provided street cred to the Nike brand. I mean, this it doesn't yeah. get any any more credible than this. Yeah, really great job by Nike. Yeah, it it really is. Um, another way to uh, to uh, tap into some new ideas would be uh, remix and reinvent. Is that a dressing room in the center of Bryant Park? Why not? Am I looking at a, a mashup of a yoga class and a petting zoo? Maybe. And this really is a thing, by the way. Uh, of course it is. Go, go, go yoga. Go, go yoga. We're going to do that soon. So yeah, I definitely need to try. Get ready. All right. And uh, another way to find some ideas is uh, by tapping into unlikely sources. Uh, what perspectives and personalities would be really unique in your brainstorm session? You know, invite those people in, listen to what they have to say. Um, you know, the same faces that a brainstorm over and over, it gets boring, the energy level drops way down. What I do is uh, at a specific juncture in the, uh, in the process, I bring some kids uh, to the table, some young kids, you know, like a six-year-old or a seven-year-old. I love getting their perspective and the, you know, brutal honesty that only a first grader will give you about an idea or about a mascot or about a uh, a prize or a giveaway. It's, uh, you know, it really kind of changes the energy and, and you get a, a whole different kind of set of uh, ideas. Uh, so I, I recommend it. Just have pudding cups and a lot of napkins, and then they'll, <laughs> they'll stay as long as you need them to. Yeah. And um, interview, interviewing kids in research is always an express way to the truth. Always. Yes. Yes. Painful. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes painful. <laughs> cool. All right. Another way to uh, find some fresh ideas, uh, you could rip off social media. You know, go to the front line of human interaction and see what uh, people care about. See how they're expressing themselves, why they're mad, why they think something is cute. What happens when meme meets pop-up? You know, all roads lead to Kylie uh, at this point in our lives. And uh, here she is at a Samsung event as the poster child for social media interaction. Yeah, and if, if you look closely, you're going to see Kim is right behind her. <laughs> Kim is always right behind her. Right. Um, well, that, and that leads us to uh, another, another way to find some new ideas is to uh, stalk celebrities, much like uh, 
Kim is stalking her sister there. Um, what are the rich and beautiful people doing? What about those guys on YouTube walking around in the rain wearing horse heads? Yeah. Famous means something different now. <laughs> Famous people are influencers. Stars are those who make noise and share amazing, unexpected, sometimes very dubious talents. But how can they fit into or help you create your pop-up? Leads us to uh, another uh, a way to dig into new ideas, become a student of pop culture. Know what's happening uh, right now and what's gonna be happening next month or go ahead and create trends. Why not? Everybody else is. Uh, I think pop culture happens in moments. A big moment in music took place uh, a while back when a tribe called Quest dropped their final album. Uh, the group made the moment even bigger with invite only meet and greets, uh, a gig on SNL and a uh, exclusive pop-up shop for merchandise and music. And it was their way of saying goodbye to their fans and uh, creating a, uh, a pop culture moment around it. So another big part of uh, idea creation is deciding what format your pop-up will take? What will it look like? Uh, there are five major types of pop-ups. The first is mobile. Put your pop-up on wheels or skis or behind a dog sled. Retailtainment in action. Just make it move across town or across the country. The mobile pop-up is ideal for brand building and buzz creation. And our friend Kate Spade is a big believer in pop-up. Uh, it seems like the brand is always out there with something new. And they make mobile look beautiful. As you can see here, the stairs with the stairs down and the scene dressed and, and, and beautifully lit. We have a legitimate high-end boutique. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you, if you look closely, you can see that Kate uh, brought mobile pop-up to an even more granular level by including a scooter. <laughs> right next to her pop up. <laughs> I like that idea a, of a low, yeah. yeah, like pop up, pop up. Yeah, a little so. dangerous, but uh, but very cool. <laughs> okay, another type of pop up is uh, four wall. Uh, you find an existing space, move in, and start interacting. It's cheap and cheerful. This approach is great for moving merchandise, obviously, and in cementing relationships, maybe with an advanced VIP sale. You can see here that um, the pop-up designers uh, are using the rawness of the space to provide a background for really simple, beautiful clothes. Uh, the juxtaposition works really well in this case, and I have to think, um, it saves some money in the budget uh, as well. So it's it's sort of a, a smart match of, of place and objective and uh, brand and product. Yeah, for sure. Okay, the, the, uh, the third uh, kind of pop-up is site-specific. Consider what is unique about the pro uh, proposed pop-up space and the neighborhood in its relationship to your brand. So again, it's not just the building, but what's around that building or, or park or site. What structures or, or, or uh, areas can be repurposed in a completely unexpected way? How can your brand be a great neighbor? Site-specific pop-up is great for brand building, creating buzz, introducing a product and cementing relationships. A fun example of uh, of sites, uh, some site-specific work uh, is by Lush. He's an artist from Melbourne. He's known for uh, his public works on the streets and walls and panels and subway trains. And he tends to be somewhat confrontational and provocative and 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 funny. And you know, he's, he's always providing a commentary on what what's happening when. Um, what's interesting to us here is that where he displays his work is part of the work itself. Uh, this alley is a good example that was, this is a pop-up gallery that was Lush's take on uh, traditional galleries. So he basically um, 
kind of took over this uh, this this alleyway, and visitors were invited to uh, to come into the gallery that had been uh, you know outfitted with stanchions and had you know the walls all painted uh, one color, and the uh, the joke was he was making a comment on uh, those folks who uh, erase or buff out graffiti. So as the show progressed two guys came along and just buffed out all of this art unless people bought it. So you'd have to buy it out from, you know, before the guy got to it. Um, so, you know, he's making a lot of statements and he's doing it in an interesting way. And he could not have done this kind of thing or made this kind of statement in any other kind of setting. So it, it's really interesting when it all really starts to make sense like that. And as you can see, Lush himself, the man, is doing a... <laughs> Badass security guard there on I mean, the left side of the screen. That's right. That, that makes it even better. It does. I, <laughs> so a less, I, um, you know, a less uh, provocative uh, example of this uh, motorcycle gear being uh, exhibited and sold in a renovated garage. Again, that makes sense. Um, it, it, it's a perfect uh, pairing, the man cave background for the product, and it allows for a really nice interplay of, of hard and soft and natural materials and metal materials. And, and again, there's just a logic to them being there that's really, uh, really satisfying. All right, the fourth type of pop-up is event-based tie into an existing sporting or entertainment event and share the spotlight or create a happening of your own where magical shopper moments rule every uh, i'm sorry event based pop ups are ideal for brand building introducing a product and testing uh three great examples uh this is fashion on the farm at bonnaroo uh live nation and fashion on the farm created these much needed uh cooling stations uh, during uh, during uh, the festival. And you could see that they were uh, heavily used and, and much appreciated. Yeah, this one's a really nice example of both form and function at the same time, which is an exceptionally rare experience. Yeah, yeah. Um, another example uh from south by southwest uh clearly south by southwest is the uh place to see really brave clever smart uh pop-up and interactive uh executions for brands uh this isn't uh and this is no exception um the makers of oreo uh set it up so that visitors could go on twitter suggest whatever flavor Oreo flavor cookie they wanted, and then they got to watch the uh, the printing machines uh, actually print that cookie. So it brought together all of these technologies, but they brought them together around something as simple and universal and low tech as uh, the Oreo. So you know the idea of mashup and remixed. Um, translated through an oreo and it's it's you know it's kind of brilliant and you you know i i can't imagine nobody standing there watching you know your cookie being made mm -hmm. yeah yeah oreo yeah. does an incredible job always with almost everything they do so no surprise there yeah um last quick example uh l'oreal paris who do you want to be today studio and it was timed to new york fashion week it was a pop-up spot away from the crowds of the tents and so guests could get uh, a styling a relaxing blowout an opportunity to freshen up before the next show and in this instance there the the uh, lack of proximity to to the to the shows to all of the tents made this more appealing because it was kind of a place to go and catch your breath before coming back for the uh, for the uh, remaining shows and it's just a smart uh, it's just a smart place for L'Oreal to be at that time. Okay, the fifth type of pop-up is the specialty build. This is often the most impressive and the most expensive option 
but it, what an impact it makes. These pop-ups are the eye-popping spectacles, the movable Nivea shop, the Sprite refreshment station, the McDonald's lunchbox, and the diesel radio. This pop-up style can be designed to serve any of the six objectives. So we've talked about the six mandates of a great shopper moment centric pop-up. We've, we've shared some thoughts about clear objectives and how every pop-up must have one. And we looked at the five types of pop-up that there are. All that's left is to tell you what retail pop-up will look like over the next few years. But of course, we can't do that. I'm sorry. Oh, I bet no he one can. <laughs> you know, I bet he knows that cat. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> no one can know. And that's one of the most exciting things about tomorrow's pop-up. Retail marketers are realizing that there are very few limits to the concept. They also know that they have to aggressively and continuously push the creative and the experiential because other brands beyond retail are setting the bar higher and higher every single day. So no, we aren't able to see the overall future of pop-up, but we have identified five influential pop-up trends that we believe will help shape that future. Right, uh, first up is a greater emphasis on the pop-up as a destination. Think uh, garden spots and lounges and libraries welcoming places to relax, recharge, or meet up. The branding will be subtle, but it will be quite clear who is providing this oasis to the shopper. Uh, it's a great relationship building approach. Uh, kind of at the forefront of this, uh, and take a look at the, uh, the uh, Glad Feelings store. Um, visitors were invited to lounge in one of five interactive areas designed to uh, embody the emotions associated with Glade Sense. And inside, you can see that they have different areas for lounging. The vibe is low key and calming. Even the decor is uh, understated, a mural made from, uh, from the Glade candles. So you can see that Glade has created a place that inviting you to stay a while and i think we're going to see pop-ups doing more and more of that a second trend that will impact pop-up moving forward is what uh, we call uh, co-shopperation over the next few years we'll see more and more dissimilar brands partnering to create pop-ups that promote a lifestyle rather than a range of products uh, imagine William Sonoma working with Patagonia on a pop-up event that celebrates the uh, campsite gourmet. Uh, a really nice example of this uh, is the Etsy partnership with Whole Foods. Uh, gives Etsy a physical spot. It gives Whole Foods that uh, artisanal vibe that it that it looks for, and the uh, the interplay here is about online and in world, and it's. Uh, I think it's simplicity and, it, and its logic make it re work really well. Yeah, I think the point here is that they share what we'll call authenticity. One is an online play and one is off. Two completely different business channels that are pretty much standing up for the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another quick look at this, uh, this uh, coach operation. Uh, is uh, Ronnie Feig, and he is the king of the sneaker heads. And he, uh, he, he makes and sells uh, sneakers that he thinks are, are cool. Um, but he was never allowed sweet cereals as a teenager. So he made up for lost time with a pop-up. He, uh, he sold the shoes. He also sold uh, breakfast cereal, 24. Four different kinds with 25 toppings and five different uh, kinds of milk to choose from. And all of that was served in specially designed uh, shoe boxes. And it really worked. It was odd enough to draw attention. The experience was satisfying once you, you know, once you got there. And I just think this stands as a great example of 
you can probably find a way to uh, to work with a partner and and regardless of who that partner is most of the time because I think if someone were to say I want to do a cereal and sneaker pop-up uh, three years ago I think uh, they would be counseled not to try something like that so I think this is indicative of of what's moving forward and I think it opens up just uh, tons of new opportunities for brands who you know can now kind of play with these people they maybe before didn't feel like they had permission to yeah it's all about being surprising and in this case the two the two brands stand for quirky cool which yeah. is meant to to appeal to millennials and gen z's so um kudos to ronnie feek yeah uh, another trend we expect to see is brands uh, expanding the physical footprint of their pop-ups. Uh, it will no longer be just about the interior of the space or even its facade. In a bid to extend the shopper moment, brands will utilize guerrilla tactics, uh, street teams, postering, environmental art, and installations, broadening and strengthening the level and quality of the engagement. Um, in this uh, Benefit Curl's Best Friend pop-up parlor, uh, fun spills out onto the street. Um, uh, the parlor uses uh, costumed brand ambassadors to draw attention and engage the visitor uh, before she even enters the shop or even, you know, across the street. She So they, they create the idea of um, the fun doesn't you don't have to wait for the fun to start to go in well our experience is all encompassing and it's it it sounds like a simple tactic but it really is one that allows the the pop-up to f seem bigger and to have more of a physical impact uh in the space they're taking but also in the uh, uh in the memory of the uh of the visitor and another quick, simple, but effective uh, way to kind of extend beyond the uh, the pop-up store. Uh, there's some beautiful uh, uh, tree art, yarn bombing, cr bombing created by Kids for a Celebration at the uh, Chattanooga Public Library. And they did rows of these on the walkway into the space. And I'm not showing you just because showing you this just because I used to work there, but yes, you are. Yeah, well, yes, I am. <laughs> All right, <laughs> moving on. Um, another example where I, where I did not work um, <laughs> is the uh, Rip and Dip storefront takeover, and the skate brand Rip and Dip added its uh, unique flavor to LA's Fairfax Avenue with a pop up at Known Gallery. So inside and out, uh, as you see here, the space was a showcase of various artwork installations that brought Rip and Dip's brand icons to life, and the statues and animatronics and furniture and multi-story murals that could be seen from literally blocks away. Okay, and the last is uh, looking at how social media will shape pop-up moving forward. Uh, already a, an integral part of a great pop-up. Social media will be used in new ways to facilitate deeper and more meaningful interactions between shoppers and a brand. New technology and new ways to use established technology will have impact on the physical design of the pop-up. Imagine designated selfie stations or mini stages for live feeds facial recognition filters available on shelf and video walls to showcase shopper snap stories and crowdsource options or selections. This will be a huge trend. Uh, quick look at a really fun example, again, involving cereal, and we aren't that cereal obsessed, but... Maybe we are. But we could be. Um, this was the... Um, uh, the opportunity to uh, to give the uh, the visitor to uh, to pay for uh, a sample with social currency and uh, to get help get the word out about the the new line of products Kellogg's opened to this dedicated store in London and uh, the where the deal was uh, they traded uh, tweets 
uh, for treats. So it was social currency in action. It was again activating your customers to uh, uh, extend your, at least in this instance, your brand footprint in the digital space. And similar idea was uh, the Mark, da uh, Mark Jacobs Daisy pop-up tweet shop. Um, Mark uh, Jacobs fragrance pop-up store was in Manhattan. And again, at this store, no money exchanged hands. Shoppers bought products with tweets, uh, Instagram photos, and Facebook posts by using a, uh, uh, a, a hashtag that connected it all together. So it was a really nice example um, of uh, engaging and empowering your shopper to further your message. And I spoke too soon. We have one more um, trend. And this is the uh, the fifth trend, and it's about the shopper who's concerned with the world and the people she shares it with. And she will have a point of view about social and environmental issues and will respect and support those brands that share her perspective. More and more retailers will have to articulate specific positions on issues and not be afraid to make them public. Pop-up will allow these brands to test causes and messaging before making them a permanent part of the brand persona. Um, this is a recycling event in San Francisco. It is made entirely from uh, uh, repurposed cardboard boxes, uh, coffee cups, tubing, and uh, packing strips. It was created by the San Francisco Department of the Environment and a coalition of coffee shop owners. Uh, the message was, you know, simple. Bring your cup. We'll, you know, we'll give you coffee. Don't don't use a uh, paper or plastic cup. And it was a focal point that uh, involved in a very easy way uh, shoppers in in terms of they, you know, they want to support this particular cause. Well, it's very very easy for them to do it this way, and that's what this pop up kind of wanted to uh, wanted to show them. Uh, another nice example is uh, Park Spark uh, by uh, Sprite, and it, this is around environmental awareness. Uh, the uh, Sprite Spark Parks are refreshed outdoor spaces, and the brand works with local youth and art organizations to build and restore recreation environments where community members can kind of get outside. Um, the brand partnered with LeBron James to kick off the first phase of the program, which focused on improving basketball courts. Then the effort uh, has expanded into building awareness of local street artists and their work. So you can see different ways they're reaching out into the community and demonstrating for shoppers not only what they believe in, but how deeply they believe in it. And I think, you know, that, that it's a great credibility credibility builder and you know a really a really smart tactic to explore yeah you know i'm going to save my comments on this one bradley because we are we are a little bit over time um we probably will not have time for questions either but let me just do my wrap up here and uh and then i'll turn it over to chris so w w without a doubt pop-up is a mandatory part of the retail marketing mix i hope we've proven that to you all today We'll just leave you with this. Shoppers want a meaningful connection to your brand, to the products they love, and to each other. They desire the most fulfilling shopper moment possible, one that offers monetary and emotional value. That's what pop-up retail delivers. Customers shop with their brains, to be sure, but also with their hearts and their hands and their imaginations. The shopper doesn't just go to the store anymore. She engages with retailers for the opportunity to seek and discover and socialize and dream and hide and laugh and learn and simply to be appreciated. Pop up when it's meaningful, well executed, tangible and satisfying gives her all of that. Today in retail, it truly is pop up or perish. Okay, great guys. A lot to think about and thank you Bradley and thank you Michael and I really hope that we've demonstrated today that we're passionate about pop-up. 
please think of us as a resource. And if we can help tighten your strategies or be a sounding board for your ideas, you can drop me a line anytime. Let's definitely start a conversation whenever it's good with you. And if you'd like to see a replay of the video or wish to share it with a colleague, I'll be sending a link tomorrow that you can easily view or share. For now, have a great afternoon and thanks again for joining. Take care.